Welcome. I'm Marcella Kearns, Artistic Associate at Forward Theatre, and it is my great pleasure to host our pre-show lecture for The Garbologists by Lindsay Joel. My first encounter with this play on its feet, artistic director Jen Apofgre, also directing the piece, warned me that I might be in the splash zone. It was at a designer run-through, a run of the play during which designers on the production team and sometimes crew members visit a few weeks into rehearsals and prior to tech to see what questions may fall out in conjunction with the anticipated execution of their designs. I was sitting just close enough that the team in rehearsals had not yet solved a particular moment in the play. Had they not solved it? I might very well have been in the splash zone, but they had just that morning. And that moment meant a gasp and a quiet thrill at how smoothly the illusion of reality had tricked me. A play quietly complex in its needs for technical execution and character development. The Garbologists creates an atmosphere that demands a production, immerse the audience in the reality of a New York City winter. Don't shiver too soon, though. I hope this play will warm your hearts. I'd like to start uh, talking about it a little bit with a discussion of the playwright. So Joelle originally hails from Highland Park on the north side of Chicago, not too far away from us, though she now resides in Tucson. In her words, her work explores the rituals, routines, jargon, and humor of insular communities across America. And that is a quote. A playwright, librettist, and author, she actually has a piece out now on Audible right now called The Messenger. So check it out if you're a fan of audio work and you discover that you're a fan of her work after seeing The Garbologists. Joelle earned an MFA in playwriting from Hunter College in 2016 after studying under Samuel D. Hunter and Tina Ho rest in peace, after earning a BA in English from Columbia University and attending the BMI Lehman Engel Musical Theater Workshop. Her breakout work, Trave, was a finalist at the O'Neill National Playwrights Conference and earned an LA Drama Critics Circle Award nomination for Best Playwriting. About the Garbologists itself. Lindsay Joel began working on the play in 2017. She was interested in exploring the lives of essential workers who really were called so, but not necessarily treated so sometimes. The inception of the story is treated more fully in advisory company member Mike Fisher's program notes. So I invite you to explore his reflection. But the seed of the play itself was planted when Joelle met a DSNY sanitation worker, the husband of a friend of hers. And she realized that her perception of the sanitation worker, who was the kind of person who would have that job as a rule, was really radically off base. She applied to the Ensemble Studio Theater Sloan Foundation Science and Technology Project, which commissions new plays about scientists and engineers, and landed a commission to develop her idea after arguing that the thousands of sanitation workers in New York are the city's, quote, resident anthropologists, end quote. Uh, in fact, if you're a YouTube surfer, you can check out a short feature from Voice of America, which features, uh, which she features on her website. It's about uh, Nelson Molina, a New Yorker who worked for the DSNY for over 30 years and collected, uh, I think, over 45,000 objects. He was uh, fond of saying in the several videos that I saw interviews with him that if you gave him two months, he could probably furnish a two bedroom apartment just with things he found in the trash. A really extraordinary human. I, I recommend you check it out. After making the Kilroy's list in 2020, the Garbologists enjoyed a co-world premiere at Philadelphia Theatre Company and City Theatre. Close to home, uh, Cody Estel directed a 2022 production at North Light in Chicago a year ago. And if you don't yet know Cody, he has recently taken the helm of Next Act Theatre in Milwaukee. Beyond Ford's production, the Garbologists will also appear in theaters in New Jersey and Connecticut this year. This, then, is the play's fifth production. 
and the sixth theater at which it's appeared. Joelle says that her play has been written to honor the sandmen or sanitation workers and what they've done and they do for us. Jen reflected at first rehearsal that the timing of the productions of the Garbologists is perhaps even more resonant after what we've all gone through in the last few years. These two humans, two characters in the play, invisible to the rest of the world. Uh, in fact, Joelle herself comments on how healthcare workers were applauded, and rightly so, I add, during the pandemic, but sanitation workers were not. Despite their invisibility, these two learn to see each other, and it's through this play that she asks us, I think, to consider what it means not only to read the bags, but also one another. So how did this come to forward? Jen proposes a slate of plays annually to our advisory company as a proposed season to come. The Garbologists came to us very late in our con season consideration last year. Jen happened to be on a Zoom call with artistic directors across the country as part of a theater communications group gathering. An artistic director in Pennsylvania discussed her company's 2022-23 season on that call, and there was so much overlap with forward programming. Uh, they were going to do The Wanderers, and Forward had just done it. They had just done Clyde's, and Ford was going to do it, among other things, that Jen thought she needed to hear more about her and her company. So they met on Zoom privately to get to know one another. Jen asked her if she'd done any scripts we should know about, given she said that we clearly program similar kinds of things, and of course, there's no competition for audiences or licenses. And she said yes. We just premiered this show, The Garbologists, which is about to have a run at Northlight. So let me send you the script. As we at Forward were figuring out the Tetris of this season's slate, this play just seemed to be the right fit. The play has characters Jen was interested in that have complex enough backstories, she said, that she was really eager to see unfold over the course of a play and a really challenging design world to create that she thought the audience would enjoy. As she put it, a very visceral experience it is to see a lot of trash thrown in a hopper. Uh, it's fun. Most importantly, I think we've all been seeing and experiencing audiences' interest in seeing a piece which they can connect with their hearts, plays in which they can feel invested emotionally in characters and experience a lift something that filled their hearts is the way she put it. And uh, she extended that thought to talk about a fairy tale quality that the play seems to have compared to the real world. She acknowledges that the two characters as they're written are really deeply unlikely to run across each other because of how siloed our society is now, but that the play creates circumstances which require the two of them to get to know each other and build a really great relationship. She said it feels like a little bit of wish fulfillment, but it's a good one. So here we have the opportunity to interact and that hopefully can be a beginning. Uh, I'd like to move on to the production team. Beyond Jen, who has taken on the direction of this initial production of our season, of course, a word or three about other artists joining us. First, our actors. The Garbologists is a two-hander, so it requires a really tight team to build trust with each other. Elise Dickerson is no stranger to this area's theater scene, though she makes her debut with Ford with this production. She has been seen in several seasons at American Players Theater, most recently in 2022. She holds an MFA from Northern Illinois University and comes to us from Chicago by way of Indianapolis, Indiana. Danny Jones, who plays a character named Danny, coincidentally, purely, was recently a Madison resident and taught in the University Theater Department. He's a recent transplant to the University of Washington in Seattle. He is making his main stage debut at Forward with this production, though he has worked with us before in the last cycle of Wisconsin Rights readings in 2022 and in a developmental workshop of a play by our playwright-in-residence, Juan Berry. 
I'd like to give you an inside peek now into the rehearsal hall and our first day and chat a little bit about our designers thereby. So the first day of rehearsal, our designers introduce the acting team, staff, and any guests we have to their designs and how they all collaborated to build the world of the play we get to see. I'd like to give you some of their thoughts today in their own words, captured from that day. First from our scenic designer, Sarah Ross. Now, Sarah returns to us after having designed The Wanderers for us last season. She is director of the Women's Fund of Portage County and co-founder of the UWSP Center for Women's Equity Development and Leadership. Some of her thoughts about the complicated material needs of the play follow. I won't give too much away, but hope to share with you the essence here that you'll hopefully take in once you enter the theater. I'm in love with this script, she says, because it offers really wonderful textures for a visual artist. There are a lot of layers of reality that we have to abstract a little bit. We'll see two parts of a truck, the cab's front end and the hopper, scaffolding pieces and cross bracing on sides and uh, off stage look to capture the feel of New York City. It's that kind of structure that you have to walk through often piled with garbage. She also said uh, in gratitude that so many of us contributed our own clean garbage recyclables to use for the production. Uh, I note as of this writing, forward board members, partners, and spouses have been calling upon their own neighborhoods and dropping off garbage at the forward office. So uh, if any of you who are listening now helped contribute to the props, look out, you may see your trash in theatrical reuse. Uh, Danny Jones, our actor, commented, in fact, that as they began to get more and more trash in the rehearsal hall, that it looked like Madison is getting its greens, from what he can tell. So good work, Madison. Sarah continues that they are highlighting the feel of bare bones, a really great city, asphalt, concrete, weathered, painted wood, and of course, that icky, gluey garbage that will immerse the audience in the atmosphere. She also really complimented our crew. It's a real feat for everyone who is installing this set and uh, taking care of it from day to day. Uh, has an Everest to climb. I'd like to add to our props master and assistant scenic designer, Pam Miles, and our props assistant, Callie Sensig, really worked tirelessly with Sarah to create a look that has the feel of gross, dirty snow garbage on the set, uh, not to mention sorting and selecting what our world has thrown away. Side note in a small Easter egg here, you will see cardboard boxes labeled Fresh Direct on the set. And this is classic New York if you're not a New Yorker. From our lighting designer, next, Colin Gronsky. Colin is a Milwaukee-based lighting designer and theatrical technician who is making their four debut with the Garbologists. Colin often designs for dance and has worked for several Milwaukee companies, but has also recently branched out to Door County via work with Third Avenue Playworks, among other places. We are juxtaposing reality and the abstract, they said at first rehearsal. We're asking the audience to use their imagination to fill in the blanks with so much here. So with practical lights, we're trying to figure out how to make something sparkle, like a turn signal on a truck. With atmosphere, much of what we're exploring is about color. So what color choices might capture winter in the city? One of the challenges that this play has is that it takes place over the course of a few weeks, just a few weeks, and it's winter, and it's often a similar time of day because it takes place during the shift that our workers have. So how Colin has achieved variation is something that I'd like you to take a special look at. I'd like to highlight our costume designer next, Karen Brown Larimore. Karen returns to us after having designed last year's Wanderers, part of the same team as Sarah Ross. She works often in Door County, 
but one quick fact if you don't see the details of her bio or you don't know already. She's designed clothes for three American Girl dolls, so check that out. Her thoughts on the challenge uh, of her aspect of design follow. Sanitation workers have a uniform they have to purchase. So she was looking for some variations on this theme. Uh, not theme, but very specifically uniform, a uniform look. There's a baseball cap, there's a knit cap, beanie, the logo. She said, however, it's so controlled that you have to prove that you work for the DSNY in order to be able to purchase the actual uniform. This is not too dissimilar from, uh, from other types of uniforms, such as when you see a police officer on stage. So in her words, she said, our task has been to make everything in-house to achieve the look that we see from real sanitation workers. So she has reflective material, bright orange gloves, the safety vest, and uh, I encourage you to note the differences between the two. Danny has been in service to the DSNY for 10 years, while Marlo, his counterpart, is new on the job. So of course that's going to be reflected in the wear and tear you'll see in the design. Out of uniform, just uh, for a sneak peek about character, you might see that Danny likes to wear things like Carhartt or plaid. Marlo is a little more conscious of style, like fitted jeans and a puffer jacket. Next, I'd like to speak about our sound designer and composer, Brian Grimm. Brian also returns to us after working on the Wanderers team. If you were in Door County this summer, if you're a theater goer, you may have seen him on stage in Daddy Long Legs at Tap. He will actually make his debut on the forward stage later this season as our onstage cellist in The Flying Lovers of the Tepsk. Brian, one of the things that he is really, really um, astute and has an incredible ear for is the soundscape. So he and Jen worked together to collaborate on, on a soundscape. There's always a hum. There's always a buzz in New York City. There's always a sound. So uh, he spoke about having and collecting a lot of garbage truck sounds that are very specific to the script. He's also mixing those sounds with the sounds of the city to build it into a symphony. So that moves into the realm of composition. He's interested in exploring how does this collection of sounds then become like an orchestra playing. City sounds, he said, will turn into the musical version of what they are. Big objects we see on stage will want to hear what sounds they make. So he's doing a lot of field recordings, has done to incorporate that. You'll hear his original compositions, especially in transitions and of course the soundscape of New York throughout. But I'd like to mention a few of the names of the transition compositions because that is half the fun. And this is something the audience, I'm so sorry, audience doesn't get to hear uh, or see. So, uh, so some of the transitions that you'll hear are titled Raccoon Refuse Scientists, Aluminum Groove, Do Mannequins Brush Their Teeth? Picture, if you will, or think, if you will, in your ear how that might sound. And I enjoy, I hope you can match those titles to some of those pieces. It's pretty great. I'd also like to mention uh, some folks backstage and in the booth, other members of the team. Tenley Patanza, our stage manager, is debuting at Ford with this production. Uh, also in the booth is Brad Toberman, who, though running aboard, also recently designed our Monologue Festival's lights. He's been working with us for a very long time. Abby Hess, our ASM, has been hauling and resetting all of the trash bags you'll see on stage during rehearsal and deserves a medal for it. Matt Corda, another crew member you'll see, also actually recently had a play he wrote, produced in our monologue festival this spring. So we have a lot of new members of the Ford community, so to speak, and a lot of veterans to, uh, to create this team. 
I think I'd like to turn now to a bit about our process. So actors Danny and Elise very graciously shared some insight with us into the rehearsal process. The cast definitely had some adventures in research and in physical care along the way to get to know and inhabit the life of a so-called Sandman. As with designers, uh, I would like to share their insights directly. And as with the garbologists, really, this is the quotidian for the actor, doing deep research, sometimes shadowing physical observation in order to be able to inhabit character. There's a very famous story of Cary Grant riding the streetcars all day long and just watching people in order to be able to create character or to gain inspiration. What Danny and Elise did was not only for inspiration, but also to really realistically portray, or as realistically, of course, as an illusionary world, um, puts on stage uh, what the lives, what the movements, what the, um, what the tasks, how the tasks were executed, what they were for, for the two characters they play. One element that I think was really important from the beginning, we've been talking about it for a long time at Ford, is care for the actor's body. The cast did and does a 10 minute warm up at every rehearsal and each uh, has taken their turn to lead it. Danny shared that they were developed by a physical therapist, Anita, shout out, thank you so much, who came in to help support a rehearsal where they were learning how to fluidly and without harming themselves throw trash into a trash bin. Danny says, it was really great to learn about the things you can do to prevent wear and tear from repetitive movement. You find strategic ways to do a job like the garbologists have, and you can really hurt yourself if you don't do it right. Now, of course, we know that um, building muscle takes time. Building and understanding a certain kind of movement takes time. And our actors have a three and a half week process. So making sure that they can maintain their health and that they're doing something correctly to avoid injury is really important. Danny shares that it was this movement pattern, a movement matrix. And uh, Anita shared um, this matrix was built so that they could extend as far as each of them could go, extend their reach above them, out to the sides, so that they are reminding themselves and understand that they have full extension in every direction. So the matrix involved things like bending over and arching back. Elise, in connection with the warm-ups too, uh, speaks more specifically to working with Danny too. She said that connection in a two-person ensemble and a two-hander is vulnerable, yet Danny and I were able to start every rehearsal with a big hug and breath work that I really enjoyed and valued. Halfway through the process, we would add our own spin on the warm-ups that Anita showed us. It was great to share with each other, and I think it helped us trust each other. I appreciated Anita coming to show us how to specifically work with our bodies for the lifting and um, resistance work we had to do with the trash. The cast also did a walk along. Brian Johnson, another shout out, thank you to the streets department, met with the acting management and a directing team down the street from the Overture Center on the second day of rehearsal. 7 a.m., the team shadowed a truck on Mifflin for about an hour and reflected and applied what they had learned in order to help launch their discussions and really their process as they returned to the rehearsal room. Danny says specifically about it, that gave us the best picture of how disgusting garbage can be. Definitely some items were already broken open as we were watching people collect it. And that's something that they had to decide that folks just had to deal with themselves. But they ended up picking up all these big things, he said. We got smells, sounds, got to, of course, get a perspective of the truck from street level and what it looks like to load large items especially as that's actually going to be something you will see in the production. 
The actors also got to do a ride along. And this is something actually that other productions of the Garbologists have been able to do for their teams as well. So Madison, Sam men, welcome to Lise and Danny onto trucks for a ride along to observe really how they handle the truck and collection and to talk about the work. They arrived first at what um, the department calls the shop. So where there are clocking blocks, break rooms and more. Danny uh, commented specifically that he loved that everyone had their own unique Cadillac lunchboxes. And then each actor rode around for about an hour and a half once again to see a route. Elise uh, said her favorite part of the ride along was talking to Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Thank you about his life. He geeked out about my job, she says, and I geeked out about his. It was lovely and will be one of the coolest experiences ever for a long time. From Danny, uh, he also felt that his ride along was wonderful. Hello to Barrett. He said, I got to talk to Barrett a lot. Got to see a lot of concrete physical actions for work with the steering wheel and how comfortable it was. Barrett had been working with Madison Streets for 10 years, so just about the same time, coincidentally, that Danny has worked for the DSNY. He said, I also got a lot of really great inside information. The most dangerous parts of the job, the serious things versus the not so serious things. And I got to see the ease with which he was in the truck. Barrett was convinced that after a week, one would have it down, Danny said, but I wasn't so sure. He was just so comfortable. <laughs> Uh, speaking of this work, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the DSNY context on the job and the world we're creating. So the DSNY is a very specific mission, and here are a few stats, and I'd like to pull this uh, verbatim from their website. This is, uh, this is, this is their, these are their words, not mine. They say they keep New York City safe. Clean, safe, and healthy by recycling, collecting, disposing of waste, cleaning streets, attacking the scourge of illegal dumping, and clearing snow and ice. This last part you will hear about uh, and witness in the play. Here are some stats. The DSNY collects 24 million pounds of trash, recycling, and compostable material every day. We operate 59 district garages, what we heard about in Madison as a shop, manage a fleet of more than 2,000 rear loading collection trucks, 450 mechanical brooms, 705 salt spreaders, and several dozen bike lane operations machines. And this is something that you, you may have heard about the DSNY last year quite a bit, and I think it's made the news again. There has been a, a real uptick and a problem with rats in the city. Mayor Adams hired um, a new commissioner of the uh, Department of Sanitation in order to wage a war on rats. Jessica Tish, she was appointed last year. She's the one who said, you might've heard this in the news, the rats don't run this city, we do. Uh, the latest news from that end is that in June, New York, um, the, the city, the department laid down some strictures that food related businesses need to up their container game. They need to have secure containers. And now Mayor Adams too is touting moving towards clean streets from mean streets. So sorry, rats, no more leftover sushi going forward. We'll see. Uh, if you want a job with New York's strongest, I saw that the call for the 2022 New York sanitation worker exam advertised the job as having a base pay of $83,000 after five and a half years of service benefits, a pension again, touted as New York's strongest. The DSNY puts service really front and center. It's for your community. It's for your family. It's for you. To become an entry-level Sandman, you have to pass a written, physical, and medical exam along with a background check and a license check. Now, I know I've been using uh, a lot of slang here. That's because you will hear some of that in the play. Um, but thank you, sanitation workers. 
Thank you, Department of Sanitation, for everything you do. I'm applauding you now. I have a few fun facts as we move towards wrapping up. Um, these are borderline, but not quite spoilers. I don't think it's going to be necessary to have to skip ahead. But I will say this. First of all, there is a very special cast member on stage. You will know her when you see her. No spoilers, but I will leave it at this. Yes, she's real. And the production team has named her Garby. Another fun fact you will hear some Shakespeare on stage when you see the performance. And when you do, I'd like you to consider and recall if you are an APT goer that Elise Dickerson played Ophelia in APT's production of Hamlet last summer. Fun coincidence there. Finally, uh, I think he'd be okay with my sharing this. Our wonderful sound designer and composer was at first rehearsal spending part of his honeymoon with us. Congratulations, Brian. There are a few events surrounding the production. The one that I would really like to point to here, not so much an event as something that you can see really any time that the overture is open. If you entered via the Henry Street door or wandered down the hall um, at any point recently, or if you will have the opportunity to, depending on where you're seeing the production from in person or digital, um, you will see an uh, evocative exhibition in conjunction, excuse me, with our production. It's called Garbology, What We Throw Away. And it is uh, the ultimate in upcycled trash. It really explores thematically our relationship with garbage. Forward, the Madison Arts Commission and the Arts and Literature Laboratory are presenting recent work inspired by and composed from the things we discard. So one man's trash is literally another man's gallery treasure. If you are going to the overture, grab a drink or a snack, stroll down the hall and take in the exhibition before or after the performance. The bar is actually going to be open an hour ahead of performances um, for the garbologists and through our season, I believe. So uh, you have some time to take in some art. Uh, be some visual art before you see some theatrical art. As I wrap up, I would love to give you a few things to consider. So going forward, if you are accustomed to our playbill, our going forward invitations or questions in the playbill will actually appear here instead in the pre-show lecture this year. I'd like to ask you to think about a few things as I send you to drinks, the sounds of New York, and maybe art from upcycled materials. So first thing, the DSNY picks up so many tons of recyclables and trash every collection day. How much do you throw away? How much do you generate? Sure, those could be questions I could ask were this a different play. Instead, the next time you throw something away, I'd like to ask you to think about the story of it passing through your hands. What does it say about you? Your life, your given circumstances, your circumstances in the moment, your values, your feelings. Where perhaps do you see the extraordinary in the everyday? Now, beyond the exhibition in the hall or the gallery outside the playhouse doors, I'd like to invite you to check out the Playhouse after the house opens, if you are going in person. There will be a very specific New York-inspired mix of music for your entertainment and to get you in the mood for the performance. If you are watching this from far away, if you are digital, then I invite you to think about all of the songs that bring New York to mind. Uh, my personal favorite is An Englishman in New York. Have fun with brainstorming. Meanwhile, look out for the trash pandas. Thank you for listening. And my friends, welcome to our season. Enjoy the show.